And if you do take the time to look at the Kickstarter campaign, there are certain levels of donations. There's a tape being offered, there's signed books being offered, there's shouts out in the book offered. So thank you to all the donors of this campaign. We appreciate you. We couldn't do it without you. And uh, Tommy's book, there's a lot of books being put out right now or, you know, in the recent past. And I tell you what, they don't hold a candle to this book. If you want to know the inside stories of Death Row by someone who was there from early onset until the very end, Tommy's book is what you want to read. And with us right now is Tommy D. How are you doing, Tommy? I'm doing fine. How about yourself? Doing fantastic. Uh, it looks like we got some people on here. And uh, after a quick little Q&A between me and you, uh, if you would, we're going to take some questions from the audience. Looking forward to it. All right. We're going to go ahead and start it out. The book, Stranded on Death Row with uh, Dr. Dre. I I'm sorry. The book, Stranded on Death Row with Tupac, Snoop, and Dr. Dre. Um, that's what we're crowdfunding here right now. Tommy, what prompted you to write this book and why now? Uh, actually, start, started writing it about five years ago. I found myself like I'd like, be at a party or in the studio and I'd be telling death row stories. And I kept hearing over and over, you should write a book, you should write a book. And then I thought one day, what the heck, I should write a book. <laughs> so I started it with Ben about four or five years ago. We got it halfway done and my father passed away. So I decided to split Iowa because I retired, moved back, and I came back to L.A. to get back in the movie music business and uh, so we wanted to have it out by the time of the movie but we didn't have it completely the way we wanted to but it's almost there this is a j mix exclusive you personally worked on that tyson song let's get ready to rumble mm -hmm. was that the last song tupac ever recorded yeah, that was the last song that we, we had done with him, which was a really strange day because it started out with us in this cheap studio that was for orchestral, and, and Lance calls me, you better get the studio, get the studio, Tupac's foaming at the mouth. I'm like, what? He goes, I said, I'm taking my air conditioner back. He's, fuck your air conditioner, man. Tupac's pissed, man. He's foaming at the mouth. He just went outside. He's screaming at everybody. I said, what are you talking about? So I get up the studio. He goes, man, look at it. So I get up there, Tupac had kicked the speakers out of the subwoofers because you couldn't even have low end in there. It was just really, he was all very, very upset. He had, Lance said he had called Suge, wanted to know why he wasn't at K&M, why he was sent to this shitty studio, and why other artists were having the studio that hadn't even put albums yet out that were taking a long period of time. Tupac wasn't probably aware that Tupac, that, that Suge was stockpiling these, these albums to give to Sony. So we went over to track records so we shifted over there. So it was this big thing. Should came with all security. And we call that day the Last Supper because uh, they ordered food for like 50 people, all this barbecue and everything. Tupac did the, the Tyson song. He listened to the Machiavelli song and everybody took off. And it was just me and Lance with all this food for like 50 people. <laughs> and we for three days, we just ate all this barbecue and stuff. But Lance is the one that came up with the uh, title, the, the Last Supper, for that for that evening. And that, yeah, that was the last time we saw Tupac. What was your reaction to hearing that Pac had been shot? I was disappointed because Death Row had us under the impression that we had security that wouldn't allow anything to even happen to anybody, that we were completely safe and we were untouchable. So it was really disappointing. And I thought for sure Tupac was going to make it through it, you know, because once he lived one, two or three, four days, I thought he's, you know, okay, we're going to be all right. But then he passed away. And that was a sad day. Were, at any time, did you, you guys weren't expecting violence, were you? Um, when? Just the, in general, during uh, 96, when all the disc records were going out, were you guys worried that something could happen to someone from death row? Well, the, the it, it, when they did the New York, New York song, which I think that was done before Tupac got out of jail, they went to New York to shoot the video, and they were shooting, somebody was shooting at the at the dog pound through the, they, they, the dad said that bullets were coming through the, 
the trailer they were in. So, which, but they claim, the Dog Pound claimed that the New York New York song wasn't a diss song at all, and it was misinterpreted. And I, I don't know what to think about all that. Um, I do have, I remember once, I have this tape, it's a Farrakhan, is giving a speech, and he's invited all the rappers to his house about putting on a, a tour for the, for, the, for the church, and all the proceeds go to the church. And, and they bring Ice Cube in to surprise everyone. Here's Brother Ice Cube. Fat Joe stands up, starts showing Ice Cube. It's you that started the war with the, with the West Coast, with the West Side Connection stuff. It's not, it's not Snoop and those guys. And there's just like this big argument. I still have that tape today. It's very interesting what took place in that, in that meeting. But the Dog Pound, like in Snoop, you know, like you asked earlier about the, him and Tupac with the beef. Snoop just didn't want to get involved in all that stuff. So, did I expect violence happen? Not really. I thought it was all going to blow over. You know, I thought maybe people were assuming it was like a little bit of studio gangster shit that was kind of going on there, as opposed to the real deal. There, there's there been a big story for a long time, and I, while I had you on here, I wanted to ask you about it. Did you ever hear of a chain being snatched at the Lakewood Mall? Was that a story that was going around before the shooting of Tupac? Well... You really wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't, people didn't talk about that kind of stuff. The only time I ever heard stories or something is if I was sitting there and then like two guys were talking about something, but there was no gossip. At death. I mean, in something like that, the chain thing, there was a lot of chain snatching going on. I mean, but to go into that area, I don't care, snatching anybody's chain or any, no matter what kind of chain or anything, that's going into, you're asking for trouble. That's that's just something that, that you don't want to get involved with. And then, so every time I heard about chain snatching, you knew there was going to be some a problem with the, with that. Should get you used to actually punish an artist by having the death of security go into the house and taking their chain away from them, and then when things were cool, they would get their chain back. And I thought that was kind of a little bit <laughs> unusual. Um, there's been a lot of press uh, about the whack room. For those that don't know, can you tell everybody what the whack room is and how, how uh, that got started? What it is, it was there it was a a lot of people call it, say that it was a closet. So I want to clarify that up. It wasn't a small closet, it was more of a, a storage room where the studio would store its equipment. So since the two studios were being used, we had a lot of guys coming in from Chicago and there was so somehow one day the storage room, there's people in the rapping and the speakers in there. Now there's a drum machine. Then the next thing you know, there's three drum machines set up with keyboards and everything. And then the next thing you know, Shug gives two people an order, which was Hurt em Bad and uh, Daryl, to start making beats. And nobody in, the, nobody in there but them. And they had never made beats before, really. And so they're in there making beats under the orders that if they didn't come up with a hit, they were going to get their asses kicked. So these guys are like actually scared. I mean, Joe Harper, like on Hurt and Bad, we, we didn't they would have to pull all the equipment in, save it to just bring it in the studio, lay the track down. So that was a whole nother nightmare. Is it going to load up right? Is it going to work? So they're all nervous. So Tupac starts taking the beats these guys are using. And Tupac could flip songs, so rap so good over something that you just, he turned these beats into the whole nother thing, which is what the Machiavelli album was. You know, those beats are a little bit unusual compared to what people were rapping on back then. So they were calling it the rack room because those guys in there learning how to run the equipment, making beats, and they're they're scared, they're timid, and so they just called it the whack room because everybody expected them to not come up up with anything, but they did. And that's pretty much what the Machiavelli album was, with the exception of a few songs by QD3. Do you, what do you say to those that think people fake uh, that Tupac faked his own death? Did Tupac what? Fake his death? Yes, sir. Well, that's a very interesting question because he's no dummy, and I don't think he'd put himself in a position where he he wouldn't go back. He knew if he was going back to prison, he wasn't going to get out. To tell you the truth, because he's mentioned that many times. And you, if you look at the Machiavelli, the Seven Day Theory, where the prince faked his death and came back. And his infatuation with that, 
and everything. And if you sit and watch on YouTube all the the theories and stuff, it makes me wonder. <laughs> you know, and I never really thought about it too much until I watched all that stuff. And then I thought to myself, okay, what happened that last night at the Last Supper? That he never wanted to hear stuff back, but he wanted to hear the Machiavelli album before he left to Vegas. And he said, he came back to me, and I'll never forget, he just looked at me and he said, have fun mixing it, do stuff like, make stuff pan back and forth. And he winked at me and, and walked away, and they left. But I didn't think about that conversation until about six or seven months ago when I sat down and watched all that stuff. Some of that can be pretty expensive to the lies, you know, if you, if, you, if you check into it. But then you have people that say, oh, he's dead as a doornail, there's no question about it. We'll never know unless he comes back if he really died. Did you take that conversation to mean when he was talking about the pan that it, the first time that he'd ever done that? Did you take that to mean that he was implying that it would all pan out? No, no. Uh, what he meant was the uh, panning is when you have speakers left and right. You like the voice might come over to this speaker and then that speaker and they pan. But, so, but he never talked engineering talk to us. Like he never said, do you know? Like he never talked engineer talk to me. No. So when he said pan stuff back and forth, like. Since when does he tell me how to engineer? The only thing he ever said was, turn up the drums real loud, turn up my voice real loud, I don't give a shit about nothing, I just want people to hear what I'm saying. That was his idea. <laughs> I, I, as we close this, I want everybody to please donate and help crowdfund the book, Standing on Death Row, with Tupac, Dr. Dre, and Snoop Dogg. Um, Tommy, it's been great having you on here. We appreciate everything that you've done for us and all the music that you've given us. Can you tell people where they can follow you on social media and uh, where they can get at Tommy D for uh, actual production and engineering? The serious inquiries. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram. I'm not too hard to find at all on a search engine. If you just type in Tommy D Tupac, all kinds of stuff will come up. Uh, you know, Tommy D on Twitter, as Ben would say. But I do want to thank... Mixmaster and, and Bobby and Jesse, you and Ben and all these people, Chewy, that helped with the give us ideas of what to talk about today. Thank you. And thank you, Tommy. And uh, we appreciate all the backers. And uh, we'll see everybody next time. Thank you so much, Tommy. Hasta la vista. <laughs>